I just played through the entire 2D Metroid series for the very first time in 2021 leading up to Metroid Dread's release. Do these games still hold up and are they worth playing in 2022 if you haven't yet? Let's find out. I'm going to avoid any major spoilers or solutions for anyone that decides to watch this and hasn't yet experienced these games for themselves. Also, make sure you guys stick around to the end because I'll be revealing my ranking of the main 2D Metroid games, including Dread itself. When Nintendo revealed Metroid Dread as Metroid 5 in that direct after saying they had nothing to show for Prime 4, I was literally one of those dorks that was like, wait, why are they showing Metroid 5 before they even show us any gameplay of 4? Yeah, I was that guy. Literally my only experience with Metroid and Samus was obviously Smash, and also a little gem called Metroid Other M. I know, I know, please put down the pitchforks. I've corrected myself, okay? It's fine. Anyway, I actually enjoyed Other M back in the day, mainly because I had absolutely no context. Um, I even replayed it several times, but now that I've revisited it, it's pretty... Um, yeah, it's not great. But anyway, what was it like to play through the main 2D Metroid timeline for the very first time in 2021? Well, let's get right into it. So, because I don't hate myself and wanted to actually have a good time, our journey begins on the Game Boy Advance with Metroid Zero Mission and not on the NES. Let me just start by saying that the very first thing I did after completing this game was play it again. It was just that good. Everything from the tight world design of the planet Zebus, the triumphant and adventurous soundtrack to the extensive lore and intense boss battles just captivated me. The game has enough linearity to prevent a newbie like myself from getting too frustrated, but at the same time has enough options for exploration and fooling around to keep things from feeling like you're just on rails. The design of these games is nothing short of genius. You start out weak with limited capabilities and encounter inaccessible areas or enemies that will do nothing short of destroy you. But as you explore the planet and gain new abilities and power-ups, you feel more and more powerful. The thrill of returning to an area and exploring an area that was previously inaccessible or just running through enemies that previously made your life miserable is immensely satisfying. I was extremely impressed by the use of environmental storytelling here both in a narrative sense and the way the game clues you in on what to do by what you're presented with. This series as a whole excels at using show don't tell. I was also very impressed with the combat and controls in this game and how many tricks Samus had for the limited buttons available on something like the Game Boy Advance. Combat felt strategic and satisfying, and exploration felt worthwhile and very enticing as you never knew what power-up might be around the corner. Due to the healthy amount of drops from enemies and cues on what you're supposed to do as much as the game was difficult, it felt like it was fair and any death was truly my fault. Well, for the most part. So just a couple of negatives here for me personally on this one. Feel free to disagree and comment why I'm wrong here, but the final boss feels extremely unfair and honestly pretty cheap. I think they held on to some of the original NES design for this one, but at no point did the fight feel fun. On the contrary, it was a slog that once completed garnered nothing from me but a massive sigh of relief and feeling returning to my hands. As much as I enjoy the extra ending section of this game, the titular Zero Mission, after the experience with the final boss and its spaghettios of death in my first run, it felt almost cruel to go through such a lengthy and punishing stealth sequence directly after that. Although I will say I appreciated this section much more in subsequent playthroughs due to being more familiar with patterns and routes and such. All in all though, I found this game to be an excellent starting place for the series and just an incredibly well designed and entertaining video game to experience. Next up in our journey, I actually originally intended to play Samus Returns for 3DS. However, you guys pointed me to something you referred to as AM2R. So AM2R, for those who don't know, stands for Another Metroid 2 Remake, and it's a remake of Metroid 2 on the Game Boy. It adds not only quality of life features such as a map and smoother controls, but all new visuals, bosses, music, and even new areas. Oh, and one other thing, this isn't even an official remake. It's a fan game. Let me say that again. This gorgeous game, modeled after the visual style of Zero Mission, was made by a fan. Someone who goes by the name Dr. M64 to be exact. I was hesitant to play a fan game at first, but it turns out that this one is just what the doctor ordered. <clears throat> Jumping into Samus Returns and then back into the pixels with Super may have been a jarring experience, but AM2R kept me right at home with a similar visual style and control scheme to Zero Mission. Thankfully that level of familiarity doesn't hold this game back from taking its own leaps into new territory though. 
I do have some gripes with this one, but I'll start with the positives. First off, I love the approach this game takes to its lore with the use of extensive logs and backstory given to almost every aspect of the game, from its enemies and bosses all the way to the planet itself and the mysterious ruins of the once mighty Chozo race. This game just oozes with atmosphere and life, which helps to keep you engaged amidst the otherwise relatively repetitive Metroid showdowns. The music of this game combined with the dense and dark cave systems interrupted by mysterious ruins and almost neo-futuristic architecture of the Chozo creates a very oppressive atmosphere that stands in stark contrast to the otherwise lighthearted and triumphant feel of Zero Mission. Even amidst the darkness, the level of endemic life and story told through the environment alone is right on level with Zero Mission, if not exceeding it in some instances. Besides the Metroids themselves, which you have been tasked with eliminating, the game has several interesting and varied boss battles which I won't spoil here. These bosses offer a healthy level of challenge, but I am happy to report that none, even the final boss, carry quite the same level of annoyance that Zero Mission's final boss did for me. On the contrary, I thought the final boss in this game was a really interesting and fun fight, even though I didn't kill it the cool way. If you watch the streams, you know what I'm talking about. Now for some gripes. As I alluded to before, the main plot of this game is exterminating the Metroids on their home planet. While a genocidal bounty is an interesting plot that I haven't seen used in really any other game, it does create a bit of a repetitive experience, as the majority of your foes will be the Metroids themselves. You do get to some more evolved forms that up the challenge and are actually quite entertaining, but I think the point stands. Another thing I don't think I'm a huge fan of is the spider ball. Yeah, I know, I kept forgetting that I had it at all, but still. The idea of the feature is interesting, but it makes you feel like you need to roll all over the ceiling and in every crevice, which in most cases I don't think is actually necessary. I also feel like it's kind of a strange ability to be in the game on top of something like Space Jump, as it's just kind of a weaker version of that in a way, and it's also a lot slower. But anyway, let's swing this back positive to end this one really quick and touch on the technical aspect. This game runs like a dream. The pixel work is gorgeous, the controls are tight and extremely responsive, and the high frame rate just makes it a joy to play. The fact that this game is a fan game is just massively impressive, and even though Nintendo itself may have discounted it, I feel like this game reached such a level of polish and success that it earned its place not only as part of our road to Metroid Dread, but as a serious part of the Metroid timeline. Thank you to you guys who suggested this game and hung out as we played through it, it was honestly a blast. So in the last game, we killed every last one of them, except for the baby. The baby hatched after we defeated the final boss and helped us to escape the planet. Super Metroid picks up right where we left off as Samus delivers the baby to the Galactic Federation Research Station for testing, and immediately takes off to seek out other bounties. After all, the last Metroid is in captivity. The galaxy is at peace. Or is it? Right away, this game just tonally sets itself apart from the Metroids before it. The intro is totally linear, but does an amazing job of setting the stakes and the main driving motivation for this game as Ridley attacks the station and takes off with the last Metroid. Where does he go? Right back to the planet Zebes. Samus takes off after her rival and thus the story of Super Metroid begins. I will not be discussing major plot spoilers for this game because the last thing I want to do is ruin someone else's experience of playing through this game. If you haven't played Super Metroid yet, do it. It's absolutely incredible. The fact that this game came out in 1994 just blows my mind. I have pretty limited experience with SNES games, but that being said, this game is truly unlike anything of its era. The world design is some of the best I've ever experienced. Zebus in this game is a massive winding labyrinth of adventure and exploration, and similar to each game in this series, Super Metroid excels at environmental clues and storytelling to move the game along. One of my favorite aspects of this game as a hobbyist musician has to be the soundtrack. Man, this game has some incredible music. I would liken it to something like Ocarina of Time, where every track is just infinitely replayable on its own, even without playing the game. The soundtrack does an incredible job of setting the tone for the game, a feeling of unease in an extremely hostile environment. The boss battles in this game are also super cool. Much more variation in bosses and locales than the previous game, and the fights are challenging while not being completely unfair, which is just the perfect balance. Some even have some interesting cheese strats to beat them, either just quickly or in a unique way, which really adds to your freedom in the game's replayability. So a really big aspect to this game is speedrunning. 
even more than all the other Metroids, and for good reason. I would liken the controls of this game to something like playing a musical instrument. It can feel a little bit awkward at first, but with practice and repetition you can pull off moves you never thought were possible. The game doesn't completely give away its whole bag of tricks right out of the gate, but with some exploration and the help of some animals, or your chat, you'll be flying around the game like a superhero. This would be where I talk negatives, but, um, I don't know. Anything I say here is a reach, to be honest. I would say the default controls are definitely a bit awkward, but it's totally usable, and now you can just remap it on the Switch, so it's kind of a non-issue. Aside from that, though, I don't know, guys. This game rocks. One of the most hype finales to any game I have ever played and the journey to it is just as great. I've played it like five times now. I knew from you guys that this game was considered the best and it was just immediately clear to me that there was a good reason for that. Everything from the tone of the world, the fantastic and even surprising story, the layered and interesting control scheme, and one of the most memorable soundtracks I've heard to date all comes together to craft a timeless experience that will absolutely stand the test of time as a triumph of gaming and a gem in the Metroid series. Hashtag save the animals. Next up in our journey, we come to Metroid Fusion. It should be apparent from even the cover art that things are going to be a little bit different this time. So obviously it's kind of tradition at this point for Samus to just lose her power-ups at the start of the game and slowly regather them to gain strength. But this game really takes that concept and runs all the way with it. We just spent the last few games with triumph after triumph, and at the end of Super Metroid you can really feel that Samus is reaching her fullest potential. She's become the strongest being in the galaxy. Unfortunately for her, in the beginning of Fusion, Samus has her own 2020 moment. It turns out, Metroids weren't the only threat in the galaxy. I won't go into great detail on the lore aspect, you can experience that for yourself. But there's another looming threat in the galaxy called the X-Parasite, and Samus gets up close and personal with it. Now infected by the X, Samus goes from being the strongest she has ever been to being weakened almost to the point of death, only being saved through the use of DNA from the very thing she previously sought to destroy. A Metroid. Now weakened and vulnerable, Samus is forced to begin her next mission, investigating an explosion at the BSL research station. Now I have to admit, during my first on-screen playthrough, though I did enjoy the game, Metroid Fusion frustrated me a bit. Samus's weakened state caused the player to take much more damage than before. The game has far more text and forced story beats than Super, and to be honest, it made me feel a little bit restricted. Especially given the fact that I had even lost the ability to wall jump infinitely and bomb jump like I was in Super. The bosses in Fusion I found to be much more challenging than previous bosses, some even to the point of frustration. I let the challenge and differences distract me to the point that I think it hindered my enjoyment early on. Now after completing the game and even replaying it a second time, my appreciation has grown significantly for this one. After the success of Metroid Fusion, they could have easily made what was essentially a repeat game. Grab onto the feel of Super, the power that Samus had in that game, and get an easy crowd-pleasing sequel. Instead, what Sakamoto and the team did was take a risk. They completely flipped everything you knew and had grown accustomed to on its head. No longer are you Samus in her glory days, piling up bodies and effortlessly sequence breaking through a large open map like something of a god, or a goddess I suppose here. Rather you are traversing a dark, claustrophobic, and derelict location. You are weak, injured, alone, or so you think, and afraid. The feeling I just described manifested itself immediately, even in my gameplay. Where in previous games I would run full speed, screen to screen, Metroid Fusion on multiple occasions made me stop and slow down from fear. This game, through the use of art direction, atmosphere, and both audio and visual cues, excels at building a level of fear in you that I simply never felt in the other titles. It's easy to view this slowing down and linearity as a negative, but if you stop and give it a chance, if you put yourself in what's left of Samus's suit and invest in this story, Metroid Fusion grabs you in a way some of the other titles just can't compete with. This fantastic and expectation-defying direction all culminates in the fact that Samus, in her weakened state, has to face off against the greatest foe she has faced yet, herself. I'm not talking emotionally here either. An ex-parasite infected the discarded parts of your suit and stalks you throughout the ship, appearing at various points throughout the game to remind you just how small and broken you are. The best comparison that comes to mind for me here is, oddly enough, Pokemon. The way that you face Trainer Red at the end of the second generation Pokemon games, Red represents you at your strongest from the previous game. The SAX similarly is Samus at her prime. Playing as a weakened and now partially Metroid Samus and being hunted by an overpowered Super Samus 
flips the script in such a strong way it makes you understand how the Metroids themselves probably felt in AM2R or Samus Returns. To summarize other notes, the bosses in this game, when I got beyond my initial frustration, are really very good. They force you to really dial in and make the most of the limited abilities that you do have. You really are made to feel desperate in this game, just like Samus must have felt in this situation. The story has some very interesting developments about the Galactic Federation among many other things, and although very different from what came before, Fusion is really another very strong entry in Samus' story. At this point, we now jump back in time. We played AM2R first, both because you guys recommended it, but also to help us remain familiar with the controls and feel of the game all the way up until this point. But before playing Dread, we decided to do a run of a little game called Samus Returns. So back in 2017, the last good 2D Metroid game was still Fusion on the Game Boy Advance. Now with the 3DS in our hands, fans were wondering where Samus had been all these years. Although we didn't yet get the next chapter in her story, Nintendo partnered up with a team called Mercury Steam to make what ended up being essentially the testing grounds for Metroid Dread in Samus Returns. Samus Returns is the official Nintendo remake of Metroid 2 on the 3DS, and the game, while in some ways staying true to its origins, takes a lot of steps, or even leaps, forward in an attempt to modernize the Metroid series. Some of these land gracefully, and some, well, they don't. Let's just get into it. I won't dive into story too much here either, since at its core it remains the same as Metroid 2 or AM2R even. Samus kills Metroids. A lot of Metroids. Let's instead dive into some of the changes brought to the formula here, both for good and not so good. I'll start with the bad stuff here, I guess. None of these have had the same structure so far anyway, so why start now? <laughs> The team added some new moves to Samus' arsenal to shake up the gameplay, the largest of which is known as the melee counter. Samus now has the ability to swing her arm at the right moment to stop an enemy in its tracks. This gives you a window to shoot multiple high damage shots onto the target, either killing it if it's a standard enemy or dealing a large amount of damage all at once to a boss. On paper, this is a great idea, but the implementation is too strong for my liking. Rather than running through areas gunning and feeling like the Samus I had grown to love at this point, I was forced to stop and stand still, waiting for an enemy to threaten me, and then hoping I swung at the right time to trigger the kill shot. I definitely improved at melee countering as I played through the game, but I felt it slowed down the pace of the game so much, due to its excessive and at times forced implementation, that it really hindered the entire experience. Not only did I always feel like I had to stop and wait for enemies, but when I finally did down each alien creature in a room, it felt like I would only take three steps in another direction, only to turn around and be greeted by the very same ugly mugs that I had just smacked and disintegrated only moments before. This became exceedingly frustrating throughout my playthrough given the fact that the Metroid series' signature backtracking was still in full effect here. Each time I turned around, it was a slog to smack through the same enemies I had just faced. Okay, my final complaint now about this game. I've only just gotten into this series and I already talk like a salty fanboy. <laughs> But the last thing I think this game kind of missed on is the atmosphere. It's not bad, per se. I can't really point to single instances of failings. But overall, I feel like AM2R and what I've seen of even the original Metroid 2 better captured the feeling of being alone on an alien planet and faced with, quite honestly, an overwhelming amount of threats. Alright, now on to the good stuff. Although this game still suffers to a degree from the repetitive nature of the Metroid fights, the encounters themselves have been shaken up and cleaned up in a way that makes them feel more fresh, I think, than they did in AM2R. The various stages of Metroid were really enjoyable to encounter and learn how to overcome, and the now 3D visuals really enhance the design of the creatures themselves. On a similar note, this whole game really does shine on a visual level. While 3D graphics are generally just seen as better than 2D by default, it is possible to mess up a transition from 2D to 3D graphics and lose the feeling the original games had going for them. I'm looking at you, Pokemon. Fortunately, I think this was handled exceedingly well for this one. The art direction and overall visual feel of this game, even being limited by the 3DS hardware, looks really clean and polished. The 3D effect is also used very well here. If you're someone who enjoys using that feature, it's well worth turning it on as the environmental details and backgrounds can be really stunning at times with that level of depth. Back to combat changes, Samus Returns adds a whole new arsenal of abilities in the form of the new Aeon abilities. Unlike the melee counter, these are implemented extremely well and are honestly pretty sick. Some of these abilities like Phase Drift and Lightning Armor add a really strategic element to the gameplay and combat. Phase Drift allows you to slow down time around Samus which can aid in solving some puzzles as well as just slowing down a swarm of enemies to be more easily dealt with. Lightning Armor can help immensely with boss battles as damage is applied to your Aeon gauge rather than your energy. 
The strategy comes in the fact that you only have a limited amount of Aeon Energy, so you must decide when and where to utilize it. The final two abilities are Scan Pulse, which reveals secrets in the map itself within a certain vicinity of Samus, and Beam Burst, which essentially turns your arm cannon into a machine gun, which is obviously extremely awesome at tearing through even armored enemies. Another thing to note about this game is that Samus Returns adds two new bosses in the form of Diggernaut and... Well, I'm just going to leave the last one for you to find out for yourself. Both fights are very interesting though. Diggernaut is insanely technical and difficult, almost reaching a Souls-like level of challenge at first. While some may see that as a negative, I honestly found the fight very rewarding and unique. Once you learn the patterns, it becomes a very well-designed, almost dance of death with a massive mech. The new bosses are a fun addition to the game that helps shake things up for those familiar with the story already. Alright, let's wrap this game up. In summary, Metroid Samus Returns remakes Samus' second adventure while trying to innovate and modernize Metroid's gameplay. I truthfully have some rather large complaints with this game as far as its structure and design, but even with that said, it is a very strong entry in the series and enjoyable to play. Something I will add though is of all of these games so far, I find this one the most difficult to go back to after playing the next and final game on the list. That game took everything this game attempted but failed to do in some ways and made it 10 times better. Alright, let's not stall anymore. Revisiting SR388 on the 3DS was a good time, but let's move ahead. At long last, we are now entering ZDR. Getting to this game was such an incredible journey. I went from knowing that Samus was in Smash and having played Other M, to knowing almost every detail of the mainline series in only a few months. I can't imagine being those of you that played these games on release and had to wait so long, but at long last, Metroid Dread is here. Promising to conclude Samus's arc with the Metroids and riding such a long wait, this game had two decades of expectations to fulfill and an immeasurable level of hype to live up to. Nintendo once again partnering with Mercury Steam had a daunting task to complete in creating this game. The only question then was, can they do it? Can they deliver? The answer? Oh my gosh, yes. So much yes. I know most of you watching already know this, but Metroid Dread was and is an incredible game. Despite the jaffs of the world trying to make complaints that can be chalked up to user error, this game delivered on all of its promises and then some. The developers literally took all of my favorite aspects I just mentioned from each game and used them here. But not only that, they took many of the things I've complained about and just completely fixed them. Super's freedom and exploration, the triumph of Zero Mission, but also the darkness and narrative focus of Fusion, it's all here. It's hard to list all of these things I loved without just sounding like I'm gushing, because, well, I kinda just am. So, here we go. Samus has never controlled better than in this game. Controls are hyper-responsive and incredibly smooth. Samus has been given a brand new slide mechanic in this game which sounds relatively simple, and it is, but it does so much to speed up movement and keep your momentum going as you traverse the vast and detailed world of ZDR. The melee counter I complained about makes a return here, but dialed back both in implementation and design in such a way that it feels like an option rather than a necessary form of combat. You can also now perform a melee counter while moving forward, which again just elevates momentum and gives you that feeling of power back that I felt I was often missing in Samus Returns. On to visuals. I don't know how much I can honestly say about the visuals here, but they're just great. The game just oozes atmosphere, ZDR is a massive living, breathing labyrinth of a planet, and every inch has something visually interesting to look at. The environmental storytelling is back here in full force. You have everything, dark, damp caves, dense jungle-like environments, lava-filled mechanical wastelands, ominous and mysterious temples, and more. Every location tells a story, if you just stop and look. Boss and enemy design here are some of the best in the series as well. Speaking of which, enemies and especially bosses provide a healthy amount of challenge, but never feel cheap or like you're being cheated. Every death is truly your fault. You just have to find a way to utilize something in your arsenal to overcome it. At a certain point in the game, the difficulty ramps up even further, providing new interesting twists to familiar enemies as well as some entirely new ones, which really helps to add variety to the gameplay. Metroid Dread introduces an entirely new type of enemy encounter in the EMMI, or EMI, robots. These heartless machines roam certain areas in Metroid Dread and play very differently to any other enemy type seen in the series so far. The EMI will stalk you through their zones, something akin to the SAX, but where the X-Clone of Samus felt somewhat scripted and easily avoidable at times, the EMI have a mind of their own. 
They move freely throughout their zones, and when they see or hear you, all you can do is run. Impervious to any of Samus's attacks, they hunt you down, and if one catches you, well, it's not pretty. Each Emmy has its own unique ability as well to add to the challenge of avoiding a grisly demise. Kindly though, the game balances the punishing insta-kill of the Emmy well by only throwing you back to the entrance of their zone, so it's never too frustrating. To be entirely fair, I think the novelty of the Emmy does wear off a bit in subsequent playthroughs, but that could also just be attributed to the fact that you develop a greater skill at avoiding them. I don't want to spoil all the details of the story here just in case someone's watching this without playing the game, but the story in Metroid Dread is simply amazing. The game strikes a wonderful balance between the environmental and subtle storytelling of many of the titles and the more focused narrative of a game like Fusion. The revelations in the later parts of the game are extremely cool and just a great way to end off the Metroid arc for Samus as well as provide some further context for some of the past games. Everything really comes together in an intelligent and exciting way. If I had to list a few less positive notes, it would be difficult, but I would say the music, although fantastic, is maybe not quite as memorable as something like Super Soundtrack. The music is incredible in game, but I don't think it's as easy to listen to on its own, with the exception of a few tracks. I would liken the comparison of music between Super and Dread to something like Ocarina of Time compared to Breath of the Wild, if that makes any sense. Both are great, they're just different, and they have different functions. Guys, I could keep going, but I don't want this video to run any longer than it needs to. <laughs> Simply put, Metroid Dread is an incredible combination of the best of the Metroid series while still managing to possess an identity of its own. Nintendo and Mercury Steam have done an incredible job reviving the Metroid franchise here, and I'm beyond excited to see where it goes in the future. Alright guys, so this is it. This is my super official ranking of the 2D Metroid games. Keep in mind though that I absolutely love all of these games. Even the worst one is a fantastic experience and I've had such an incredible time playing through this series with you guys. The official ranking of Metroid from Bandit Hylian himself is... Alright, so I'm sure some of you would disagree so comment your order down below, but Dread really just did it for me. It took all of my favorite aspects and put them together while innovating in its own ways and just barely eked out Super Metroid for that top slot. Alright guys, thank you so much to everyone who has watched and subscribed throughout this awesome journey. I appreciate all of your support. If you're here and haven't yet, I hope you consider subscribing and joining the banded wagon as I think we have dubbed it. <laughs> Join the Discord in the description if you haven't yet so we can hang out and you can be a part of choosing the games we play. But guys, I'm going to get out of here. I'll see you awesome people in the next video or stream. But until then, peace. <laughs>